Good Yantef. It's an honor to be here with all of you on this holiest of evenings. I'm so grateful to be asked to address you tonight. Thank you to Michelle, Chazan Michelle, for your insight and dedication to this community and to every single one of you who worked so hard to make these holidays so beautiful. I'm only hoping that our technology will convey my love and my care for all of you and my sense of incredible pride in seeing the incredible resilience and strength of character and vigor that this community has shown these past few months. This Yom Kippur is like no other because we find ourselves in a dark night at a time of crisis, not just in this country, but throughout the world. Mother Earth is not holding back her ire Around the planet, we see ecological disasters coming fast and furious. Simultaneously, thousands and thousands of lives are being cut short by the pandemic and businesses and livelihoods are shuttered. True hunger is everywhere. On our own shores, once the mother of exiles from whose hand glowed the worldwide welcome who provided shelter for our own tempest-tossed ancestors and so many more. Now a sense of degradation and anarchy loom. We find ourselves mourning her and also an in the flesh mother, a champion of women and a bubby to millions. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we say goodbye to her as we watch closely to what follows in her absence. In Hebrew, the word for crisis is mashber. It means a shattering. And it's truly a time of shattering, a shattering of our illusions, of our innocence, our institutions, and our norms. In conversations this summer with so many, I've heard a pervasive feeling that our culture is too far gone to save, that we're living through the collapse of an empire. You could say that it's the Jewish way to look at what's going on as a story arc that has a foregone and terrible conclusion. As my friend Alicia Joe Rabin says, we Jews are well acquainted with impending doom and we're well acquainted with totalitarian societies. We're always watching out for the moment when worrisome tips over into better get out now. But someone else that I admire a lot, Lord Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi of Great Britain, challenges this kind of thinking. He tells us, and this is a quote, forget the word inevitable. It doesn't exist, he says. Forget it, delete it. We are coming up to the Jewish holidays now and listen carefully. We're going to see a prayer which goes on Rosh Hashanah, it is written, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. Well, he says, that's the perfect statement of fatalism, isn't it? It's going to be written over the next 10 days, and there's nothing we can do about it. And then precisely two minutes later, the entire synagogue erupts with the words, but, but, penitence and prayer and charity avert the evil decree, to shuva, to fila, and sedaka. Ma'avirin et roa hagzera. He says, nobody ever accepts any verdict as final in Judaism. We completely throw out that concept of inevitability. We believe as Jews in radical transformation. We believe that our acts can literally rewrite our story. Yes. Our ancestors lived through many shatterings before this. For 20 centuries and more, Ashkenazic and Mizrahi Jews all over the world walked on tentative ground over the broken glass of Kristallnachts and Farhuds with violent expulsions, forced conversions, blood libels, and we all know much worse. Friends, alive in our bodies and souls is their cellular memory. 
testimony to their survival is our being here tonight, broadcasting our beloved tradition over screens, no less, singing Kol Nidre across the world, feeling even in the midst of this pandemic that we are together, that we are whole, that there is something larger holding us. Many of you know that my work these days and these past years since leaving Neve Kodesh has revolved around healing the intergenerational trauma in our lineage. But what about the intergenerational wisdom and resilience that also grew out of our ancestors' interface with this constant sense of impermanence? What can we learn from our ancestors whose lives were shattered and rebuilt again and again throughout history? We can hark back to so many crisis points in our history for clues and the choices that were made by so many great souls whose moxie and moral imagination lives on to guide us today in 2020. We could look, for example, to Eddie Hillesum, a Dutch woman who barely knew she was Jewish until the Nazis came, but refused her Gentile's friend's, Gentile friend's invitation to hide her and went to Auschwitz to die. Or the Piazetsno Rebbe who refused passage to America, insisting on staying with his people to the end, hiding his teachings in a bottle and burying them in the ground beneath the Warsaw Ghetto to be found after the war. But tonight I'd like to take us back much farther to the year 70 of the Common Era when the Romans held the entire city of Jerusalem in its siege. This was a time about as crazy and frenetic and fanatic and polarized as ours. The residents of Jerusalem were thoughtful. They stored food in case of a Roman siege. Three wealthy families had donated huge storehouses of flour and oil and wood, enough supplies to survive a siege of 21 years. But there were those fanatics among the community those vigilantes, they were called the zealots, the Jewish zealots, who were hankering for war. They were unhappy with the attitude of the sages who proposed sending a peace delegation to the Romans because the Romans too wanted to negotiate. They didn't want to destroy us. In order to bring things to a head and force their fellow Jews to fight, this fanatical militia set fire to the city's food stores sending the entire population into starvation. Those were Jews doing that to Jews. They also impo imposed an internal siege on Jerusalem, not letting their fellow Jews in or out. Well, the greatest sage of the time was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He understood the politics of the moment and saw what was coming. But instead of surrendering to the inevitable, that all was doomed, though it sure looked that way, he acted to transplant Judaism, not only from its location, but from its entire vision, from its entire formulation. Now remember that at the turn of that millennium, Judaism was based upon the sacred technology of a priesthood, animal sacrifices, and a temple to which an entire nation made three pilgrimages every year. And without these, well, what would be left of the religion? Now, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai saw all of this coming, and he devised a plan that would allow him to get out of Jerusalem and do something outrageous. Listen to what he did. He faked his death. He climbed into a coffin. He got his students to carry him out of the city walls saying that he had died by plague and so nobody, nobody would want to open up that coffin. He thus defied the, the zealots siege and once out of Jerusalem, Rabbi Yochanan went very audaciously directly to General Vespasian's tent. Vespasian was the Roman general in charge of the entire Middle East and Jerusalem. Yochanan entered Vespasian's tent and said two famous words. Your majesty. Vespasian fired back angrily, who are you? I'm not the emperor, I'm only his general. And as they were speaking, a messenger runs up with the news 
that the Roman Emperor Nero had just died and that he, Vespasian, had just been appointed to be Roman Emperor in his place. Well, Vespasian was so shaken by this news and by Yochanan's prophetic words, your majesty, that he saw Rabbi Yochanan as the sage that he was and he offered to grant Yochanan anything he wanted as a reward. Whew. He didn't have to think long. Yochanan said the famous words, give me Yavna and her sages. Tainli Yavna ubaneha. Let me transport my people out of Jerusalem to the town of Yavne. In other words, let me reinvent Judaism from the brick and mortar reality of a temple center Judaism into the portable diaspora ready religion that we know it, had be it became in later centuries. Yochanan was saying, grant us a fresh start. Grant us a new way of being. Let us reinvent ourselves. Let us revision ourselves. And Judaism went through a major paradigm shift, a necessary reinvention. And as we all know, it survived. On this Yom Kippur 2020, we too are asking for a fresh start, a new way of being not only for ourselves, not only for our religion, but for the entire world. One of the main themes of these holidays is death, especially on Yom Kippur. We dress in white for purity's sake, mostly, but mostly it is to remind us of the white shrouds that will wrap our bodies one day. And we avoid food and drink, and we avoid other bodily pleasures because we want to imagine a time. We want to actually to practice a time in which we will no longer have a body. On this fateful day, we are asked to confront our mortality, to die before we die, so that when we do die, we know the territory ahead just a little bit better. On Yom Kippur, we do what our ancestor Yochanan did, we smuggle ourselves out of this crazy, frenetic, and polarized world. We simulate our own death, and we name what matters most to us, what must live on, knowing that behind us is an old way of life that's burning. And then we ask, and we ask for it with all of our determination. We stake our lives on it. And with the powers larger than us, we rewrite the story of our fate. In this way, our people have reinvented themselves for centuries. This capacity for reinvention, for prayer as if our lives depended upon it, and working with and in partnership with the great powers, this capacity lies in our DNA. For these holidays, Neve Kodesh and communities all around the world have been absolutely ingenious and working, working with and around the limitations of the pandemic and creating new ways of conveying beauty and meaning despite it. This has allowed all of us to exhale, to take these holy hours and dream into what's next. What must be re-envisioned in our world? What must change? What we must work toward? What we must pray for? not only in the Jewish world, but far beyond. This year, this year, our prayers encompass all of creation, all people everywhere, the plight of our mother, the earth, and all of her creatures. Watching the fires tear across her home state this month, the prophetic writer, Rebecca Solnit wrote, Right now, hope doesn't mean envisioning rosy futures. It means knowing that the worst case scenarios are not inevitable. And every day we are choosing what direction we head in. Worst case scenarios, my friend, are not inevitable. Forget the word inevitable, Rabbi Sachs tells us. We are choosing our fate right now as we speak through our actions, through our prayers, through the caring and the yearning and the tears 
and also the kindness and the foresight that we embody. The deeply intelligent legacy of Rabbi Yochanan, Eddie Hillesum, the Piyasatsno Rebbe, and all of our ancestors live on within us to help us now. I leave you now to your evening prayers with my heartfelt blessings. I share with you, I'm with you. I bless all of us for a year of wisdom and action and courage ahead. Good yantif.